Joy, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> <laughs> sit down sit down you're rocking the boat sit down <laughs> there there was they added the <laughs> miss woods <laughs> you made me sit down All right, while we're sitting down, um, I, we are very close to uh, Joy astounding us with information about Skillful and Markle. So in an effort to capture these like really, I'm assuming great conversations you just had because I saw a lot of showing of websites and contact information sharing. And don't forget you have two networking opportunities for the next couple of days. Um, there's activities tonight. I think I told Rural Works folks, we have an activity as part of the networking tonight, but you can ignore us if you want. What I'd like you to do is there are some little note cards in the middle of your table that Mayflower has gloriously provided us. And I would love for you to share some of the ideas that you had in your one-on-ones about what employers, how employers can be part of this impact that we're trying to create for our workforce. What is what is employer co-impact? So if you wanna take a minute to write those down and I will collect them, um, it would be really helpful. And we'll start sharing that. Uh, I will find you some cards. <laughs> you use them for the purpose they were. I'm gonna share, steal some from your table. Hello, Justin Archer Birch. Good. You can sit there with Sean if you'd like. All right, anyone else need more cards? You guys need more cards? I'm sorry, you, my friends, I don't want to use you guys anymore. Hello, my friend. There you guys go. Oh, guys, I got to I got to try to remove guys from the all right, hopefully all of you had some really insightful conversations about how, how we can define employer impact, how employers can be part of this, as it is like the theme for the third year of Rural Works. And for those FOCs who are in the room, welcome to the party. You're never getting off this email list. Um, that's how I, <laughs> Angelica and I were joking at this conference that we were just at, that that's how I've gotten involved in a lot. So just like show up to stuff and I'm on the email list. Um, you can't invite me to a party, not expect me to attend. Okay, just I'm gonna take, um, while they're still fiddling, um, as you all know, some of people are not able to be in the room for a variety of reasons. It's still COVID time, RSV, flu, life, it's December, weather. Um, but does anyone in the room wanna share one of the, one of the aha moments that you had during your discussion with your, colleagues in the room? Nobody wants to share? This one? In Puerto Rico, I was mentioning to her that initially what we do is evaluate the needs of each employer. And once we know what their specific needs are, we try to engage them in customizing the curriculum. So that way when our participants, we also call them participants, they're fully trained, they will be able to go into specific jobs. Um, we also try to do interviews prior to the occupational skills training. And um, that way they can, you know, the employers, we have like an employer commitment letter where if they identify a participant that they would like to hire after training, then they're committed to hiring them. So we spoke about those. Excellent. Any other ideas? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, our meeting was just um, mind boggling to say the least. Um, so I don't remember, what's the name of your organization again? Oh, hi. Higher Purpose Code. I think everybody wanted to talk to them. Okay, so the aha moment for me was Kiva 
I for, I know of Kiva, but I've forgotten totally about Kiva and um, how they work. And so I'm going to continue this conversation because, tell me your name, Monty. But Nisha was telling me that with Kiva, uh, you know, what we talked about is that if COVID has taught us anything, is that people now do not want to work a nine to five job anymore. Everybody wants to work from home. Everybody wants to own their own business. Everybody has that entrepreneurial spirit. And that's nothing wrong with that. And that's what makes it so difficult for employers to find people to come work for them now. And so um, I think that sometimes we have to reinvent ourselves and figure out what it is we need to do to address the needs of the masses. You know, again, how do people really see themselves and what do people really want? Because just because I want to put you to work in this $15 an hour job might not necessarily be what you want to do. And so if I put you there, chances are you make just enough money and you're going to leave. And so we want to minimize um, turnover. And, and so when we were having that conversation about the Kiva project and how people, you know, it kind of works to help fund, you know, different kinds of projects that people might want to do. You have to go out and raise your initial money and then Kiva will help you with the rest of it. I'm going to get more information on that. So that was my aha. Thank you. My aha with Angelica of Washington County Workforce Development is, um, in rural communities, the, you know, they are mostly Black. So sometimes you may have to change the face of who's over it because some people may be, you know, hesitant, resistant to speaking with that person. Um, like she said, the, their head person is a white male. And, you know, in some communities, you know, people of color are not comfortable with coming coming to them. So if you change the face, also change the language so that, everyone can understand and comprehend that so that they can be comfortable and comf and confident with coming forward. So that was like an aha moment for me. That's awesome. Uh, Angelica also talks about not just the face, but the age, <laughs> like making sure like your face is someone that's in that age group and not, I love, y'all have great stories and I love spending time with you because then I talk about you to other people for hours. Okay, I will be very bold when I say this because I, I did not want to say this out loud at first, but since Shakira kind of opened the, the window for me to do it, I met with Legacy Institute and there was one issue that we had as well, trust issues amongst black people. And I have a problem with that because we so often say, black people so often say that they don't have the support, they don't have people in their corner. And as soon as you get an organization that's willing to give you all of the bread and the crumbs too, you say, I don't trust them. And you prefer to go to a white counterpart and get assistance. And so I don't know how we can, that's why we work so hard at how your purpose to change the narrative so that people can start building that trust. I understand the, the concepts and you know all of the things that goes along with like why I don't trust people, but you know, just be open-minded and be willing to, you know, understand what information is, you know, that you can share out to get the assistance that you need. So that was something that was really, it stood out. I love it. Uh, I don't know how y'all are going to capture this information on note cards, but I'm going to try to capture what you all have said. Um, I'll come in and come around and gather those as I pass the mic to Joy. Um, Joy Coates from Markle Foundation, who's going to talk about a little, I think a couple of you have touched on this already, but Markle's doing some really interesting things around employers and what we can do to help them help our clients. So with that, Joy, I will give you this. I feel like, I think that we, we all want to. Good morning, Mr. Birch. <laughs> okay. Let's see if, if Joy can get this to work now, everybody. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me or do I need to actually hold it? Is this better? This is better. Okay. All right. Let's see what we can do here. Oh, all right. Well, maybe not. As I figure this out. Okay. Okay. So I can go back. 
Great, now we've got it. Okay, good morning, everybody. If I didn't get to meet you yet, my name is Joy Coates. I'm the senior, senior manager for National Delivery Partnerships at Markle Foundation. What that basically means is I get to do the fantastic work of working very closely uh, with our partners and grantee sites around the work of the Alliance, which I'm gonna get into in a minute, and also being a main point of contact for all of our affiliate sites. So what we're gonna to talk to about today is the importance of partnerships in creating a more equitable uh, labor market. And we're gonna be talking a lot about skills-based practices, which is the cornerstone of the work that we uh, do with the Alliance. So the Marco Rework America Alliance is a nationwide partnership of civil rights groups, nonprofits, uh, the private sector, employers and others. And our Alliance partners work together to get people without a college degree into better jobs with opportunities for career growth, particularly women, black and Latino workers. And the focus when we say better jobs is really making sure that these are roles that are gonna get folks upward economic mobility. Our partners really are the strength of this work and how it gets done. You can see, you know, the list of partners there, rural list certainly uh, being among, you know, one of our strongest partners, not that we have favorites, uh, we do. Uh, but, you know, I want, I just want to take a minute to really acknowledge all the partners here. The thing that we really love about the Alliance and that I think is really important when you think about some of the issues we're going to discuss today is folk who are really willing to roll up their sleeves and work with you. These are not rubber stamp members. These are folks that will do everything with us from design convening agendas to design products, design tools, sometimes pro bono. Some of the tools I'm going to discuss today were developed by our, our partners at McKinsey in concert with our employer initiative and our, our coaching initiative teams. So I really do, uh, I really can't stress enough how important these partners are. Another thing that while we're still on the partner page that I also want uh, to hear from you all is we want to understand, even though I'm going to go through a good amount of content quickly because I'm between you and lunch, thank you, Julianne, um, we really want to understand from you in your context what you hear from me today, what works, what doesn't work in terms of rural context, what else do we need to understand, who else do we need to ask about how this work gets implemented uh, in, our rural, in our rural communities. So what you can see here is where we have already deployed. Some of you who were here earlier uh, heard me talk about the fact that initially when the Alliance was launched, we had five deployment sites in five different areas. We've scaled up uh, to the point where we now have 10. And you can see uh, each of our uh, cities shows you where the national partner is. We have one role list site, our fantastic team uh, at Pat Stone, uh, Pat and others are here today and uh, we, will, we will call on them later, no we won't. Uh, but we, we also have the other national partners. So certainly Rural Lisk, Unidos US, Goodwill and National Urban League. Another thing that we really try to stress and really want to uh, be the catalyst for is partnership and idea sharing between those organizations. So another part of my work is to have an actual work group where we bring together those national organization leads and really discuss, as you can look at the map, you see a lot of us are in all the same places. Where could we be partnering for even greater impact and greater understanding of all the populations we're trying to share when some of us have greater proximity to those populations than others so that we can keep uh, cultural relevance, regional relevance front and center so that these things that we are developing are not just sitting up on a shelf somewhere. We want these things to be owned by the folks in the field, uh, refined by the folks in the field, and we want it to stick so that we actually have the impact we're trying to have. So now before I get too much into the content, I really wanna play this quick video and I promise it is quick, it's only a minute, but it really speaks to what we understand of the problem and how we're trying to solve it. And then we'll get into what we offer at the foundation as part of the Alliance that we think is, is starting to move the needle for us in those spaces. We love when it works in rehearsal, right? Because, and I, and where is Julianne? You were inside, let me say. If I can't play this for you, y'all, I will say something, you know, completely stunning that will, that will replace this video and pale in comparison. Thank you. 
So here you see our core areas of focus. We identify promising job pathways for workers to pursue. We develop digital tools to help career coaches and other support specialists better serve their workers. And we directly engage with employers, which we're going to talk a lot about today and have already been this morning, to drive the adoption of inclusive sourcing and hiring practices and also help them to develop tools and resources to take action. This work matters because there are over 100 million Americans without college degrees who have built skills and capacity through other areas, and these talents are going unrecognized. The challenges of COVID have been followed by unprecedented labor shortages. Rape, racial disparities prevent equitable access to job opportunities. Technology and automation are displacing workers at accelerated rates, and enrollment in higher education has been declining. Why we value our partnership with Rural Lisk and others, as I, as I alluded to earlier, when we're talking about specifically proximity, what really helps us is Rural Lisk provides this invaluable insight to the specific needs of the rural population and the way that we need to co-design and co-deliver supports to, to meet those needs. They give us candid feedback on how and where we need to uh, meet our approach to, how and where we need to reset, I apologize, our approach to serving rural communities. They give us clear guidance and thought partnership on how to customize our approach for maximum impact. Uh, they, and they give us, and they have a joint commitment to leaning into issues of access and equity in rural communities. So uh, one thing I'll say here, about a year ago, Justin and I wrote a paper on how, what people can and should do to better understand what we mean when we say rural, because sometimes the, the view of what rural is, is super narrow and understanding all the different stratifications in rural. What are those populations? Black, the black rural population, Latino population, tribal populations. And the benefit of rural LISC is they have a reach and a proximity for those populations that we at the foundation don't have. And that is one of the things that we really wanna lean into because if we say, well, gosh, we'd love to do more with tribal populations and we, we don't have a team you know, that does that. But in partnering with rural LISC, we say, okay, help us understand all these different populations they're serving, what they need, how do we how do we bring them into the room? How do we get their voices at the table so that we can understand what really needs to be done and what some of the other barriers are that are specific to each particular locale and how we can then bring offerings that will actually uh, make some make some difference there. Now, a skill, as we say, a skilled space talent strategy. Now, we didn't, you know, invent this term, but it is, you know, the cornerstone of the work and how we, you know, really see uh, as the power tool for moving the needle for getting more folks into good jobs is we focus on the specific skills needed to succeed in a job and not proxies. Uh, embedding the focus throughout the employee life cycle. I like to say it's we're working end to end from the job seeker to that coach, to the hiring manager and the recruiter, and then working with the actual organizations to say, great, we've done all this work to create new pathways and to uh, prepare employees for these jobs and to make the job seeker more marketable. But all of that falls apart if we don't work with the employer to create an environment where these employees will not only be looked at and hired, but once they're there, some changes are gonna have to be made to ensure that you can keep, retain and grow them in an authentic way that meets them where they are and takes things like to the best extent possible, because we know this is going to be quite a lift that takes away the bias of pedigree, not having a college degree, not being from a certain area, and those being those gatekeepers into the jobs that really pay well and have that upward trajectory. Uh, we want to and, and we want to make sure that employers understand that there are many different ways to acquire knowledge and abilities. And if we can get all of these things working together, uh, working together in a seamless way and we have the right commitments at all ends of the spectrum, we're gonna be able to build a stronger workforce and create more, uh, create more uh, equitable access to these job opportunities. So 
When we are talking about, I know some people may work with employers, some of you, as I know some of our colleagues at Paxton have done, are working in the put your employer hat on for how you can actually make sure you're doing this in your own organizations. We talk about the first steps to adopting skills-based practices. So the first thing we recommend is removing, require, removing the credential requirement for job postings when possible. Now, when we say this in a room and somebody is there from a college or a community college, that goes over like a lead balloon. And I mean, you want to talk about folded arms and, and side eye and, you know, well, so, so what are you saying? We're not going to have colleges now, you know, and you're, and I'm sitting there, you know, trying to be charming, but now I'm terrified because I can see that that didn't work. Um, we're not talking about eliminating credentials. We are talking about increasing pathways for those who have talent and not credentials and not, you know, frankly, maybe they don't have the money to go to college. Maybe they don't have time because of children or maybe, you know, some folks still, you know, don't necessarily desire to go that route. And what we're seeing is employers are, are hurting for jobs that they need to fill. And when they really sit back and look at what they need, it's the skill and not the credential, but they put that credential on there because that's how they got their job. And that's what they're used to saying. And they don't want their VP of development looking at them and saying, well, what do you mean you hired an HR person that doesn't have a master's in HR, even though they've been working at the restaurant for 20 years and knows everybody and knows everyone's skill set and how to set culture. So that's the, these are the conversations that we are starting to have with employers. Um, and so that we're really talking about, you know, the skills themselves and not what's in this 12 point bullet, because as I'm sure many of us can attest, sometimes you get this 12 point bullet and then the person comes in and what was on the paper is exactly what you got. They actually can't do the things that you need them to do because you didn't hire for the skill rather than what the ideal, uh, uh, the ideal credential was. So some of the successes, um, proof points for skills-based practices, you see 14% more applications per view. If you, if you highlight the responsibility instead of the requirement in postings, it gets 14% more applications per view. You get 34% better retention. Employees without a four-year degree tend to stay 34% longer than employees with a degree. There is a 70% increase in productivity, effective onboarding programs. A minute ago, I talked about making sure you're ready to receive and retain and develop uh, your people. The 70% uh, increase in productivity speaks to effective onboarding programs, increasing productivity by over 70% and retention by over 82%. Five times better hiring. Hiring for skills is five times more predictive of job performance than hiring for education and two and a half times more predictive than hiring for work experience. 80% outperformance of peers. Fair screening can reduce bias, which may lead to more diverse teams and diverse teams outperform peers by 80%. And the last 42% more responses. Job descriptions that use more inclusive language led to 42% more responses and a two week faster hiring time than those that use less inclusive language. We have conversations um, on the team about language access. And sometimes when we say language access, we think we mean like your actual spoken language, like why aren't things translated into Spanish, so on and so forth. But here we're talking about language access in terms of what it does to mindset. If you look at a job, you might read it and say, oh, there's no way I can do that job because of the language and jargon and credential being listed there. But if you look at the skills, you know that you actually could probably do that job and beyond, and you actually could be the very candidate that person needs. So we think about three different areas that you really want to lean into, you know, changing your, changing your lens on this practice is in sourcing, assessment, and retention. Sourcing, you know, remove barriers to prevent talented candidates from applying. Update and publish new skills-based job postings using inclusive language. Identify new talent pipelines by connecting with worker-serving organizations. Uh, assessment, update and implement new interview guides and rubrics. Evaluate assessments and add them to your interview. Retention. Update job descriptions to focus on skills and develop internal progression roadmaps and identify offerings that provide skills your organization needs. 
Now, you can hear all of these things and you'll get the deck later and you'll get the bullet points and you say, well, that's great, Joy, but okay, that's a ton of work. And, and who exactly is getting ready to do that? And who, what skills-based job am I creating to get somebody to implement all this? So that is what we're going to talk about next, which is what we actually do and offer, starting with um, our worker-serving organizations. And if if y'all don't use that word that way, when we say worker-serving organization, we mean folks like Pathstone, our other affiliates, some of you all's organization, like whoever is actually working with that job seeker and getting the tools and resources into, hand, into their hands that I'm about to share with y'all in a minute, but not just handing folks tools and resources. We, we think that the best approach is to first understand where all the organizations are coming from what they already have on their plate in terms of you know the barriers and challenges that their uh, populations have, how they're addressing it, and then working with those folks to figure out where our offerings and our supports actually fit and augment rather than just creating a whole new set of activities that are going to sit on top. So, and when I say tools and resources to get started immediately, I'm not being presumptuous that everybody's just going to clamor. It's more of, hey, Everything that I talk about, because we've only got, first of all, we've only got a certain amount of time, but also we want you to actually be able to access these things, look at it, talk about it with your teams, and see what does or what may or may not make sense in your individual context. And we will give you some time for, for QA in a few minutes. So the first support that I want to talk about is actually the Activator training program. And the exercise we just did, which to Julianne's point was a fantastic dovetail, we were talking about what can or should employers do. And our, our colleagues on the employer teams, led by a gentleman named Jacob Vigil, who is not here with us, but he and his team run this Activator program. And what it does is it helps employers understand skills-based practices, so deepen your understanding of skills-based practices, equip you with the uh, tactics to engage employers. So it's designed with the employer in mind but the worker serving organization that is trying to get folks placed and in better jobs, it's really a tool to help you engage employers and take some of these excuses off the table about, well, we can't remove the college degrees or we can't you know, change our hiring practices now. Like, well, no, nobody can do a complete overhaul now, but there are things that you can do uh, fairly immediately with the right guidance and support. And more importantly, in the conversation that myself and the and the young lady from Texas were having the actual will to do that, the employer investment to make those changes and make these uh, intentional uh, hiring shifts. So we provide access to uh, self-paced training videos, online tools and case studies. We want the folks who are using these tools to drive the change by engaging the employer and helping their organizations fill open roles by building, building a diverse and inclusive uh, workforce. And we also wanna demonstrate the business benefits and social impact of using skills-based practices. So the data that I just showed you a minute ago, like people want to know right away, why would I do this? We're not gonna do it out of a, are we running out of time? Bye, Ms. Thank you. Uh, we're not gonna do it obviously out of the goodness of our hearts, but we wanna make it so that it's so compelling, which is why we do rely on the data and we have a whole other conversation we can have, you know, about our LMI data and what we do to, to as proof points. But we know that this has to resonate with the employer. They have to feel like they can do it and they have to feel like it's not us saying everything you're doing is bad. It's us saying, here are some ways that we might be able to do it better for the sake of the whole ecosystem and the specific populations. Um, I'm going to just really lightly touch on this so that we don't uh, run too short on time, but the content I was just telling you about, but how do we implement these practices is through the skillful talent series, which is online. This is the link and we'll share this with you in a nutshell. It talks about everything from how you can generate, um, how you can generate a skills-based job description and post that how you can you know, ask better questions, revamp your interview rubrics, revamp your onboarding, revamp how you train and develop people um, so that they can stay with your organization and help your organization actually grow. Um, you're talking about uh, getting the right talent, candidate evaluation, selection and onboarding, and employee retention. 
Skillful actually was or once a standalone program. Some of you all in the room have gone through the Skillful Talent Series or other uh, Skillful products. Skillful is now an initiative embedded in the Alliance. Um, and, and Skillful is, you know, it's right in the name. We're focused on people understanding skills-based practices, implementing skills-based practices, and championing it as um, an answer to not only the shortage uh, of the shortage of employees, but the essentially the access gap in terms of what kind of jobs folks get and who gets a good job. So this first piece is Skillful Talent Series. That's employer facing. The second employer facing tool we have, which is new, is the actual sourcing and hiring playbook so that folks have an actual resource that they can use and work through with their teams um, that can be paired with um, the Skillful Talent Series or standalone. Everything I'm talking about, just uh, so that folks know, this is all free of charge. There aren't fees attached to this, and there aren't fees attached to the support that comes with this. And this is what the job posting generator will actually look like. So you can take your job posting, pump it into the generator, and it will, it will tell you what it really should look like so that it'll be skills-based and attract the skills you want to make sure that you're actually getting the right match for what you are, what you are hiring for. The last piece that we're going to talk about in terms of the tools is career coaching. Our whole, our newest offering under career coaching is around this idea of human-centered coaching. Um, and many of our affiliates have already gone through this training. It really talks about some of the things we talked about this morning. How are we looking at all the needs of the job seeker? How are we approaching coaching from understanding what each individual person is rather than from a specific pedagogy of what we think you need to be coached on in order to advance? The last thing I'll mention is our peer learning network. So along with the tools, the trainings, the supports that are specific to the content, again, we know the real value is for practitioners to be able to do what we're all here to do today. Talk to each other. Talk to the people who are living and breathing this work every day. And we are, we are very fortunate in that our affiliates give us constant direct feedback on the things that are useful and the things that are not and the gaps. One of the gaps that was identified when we asked what we should be talking about in peer learning was the wellness of practitioners, our actual folks who are serving the job seekers, our coaches, our program directors, things of that nature, and how those folks, how we need to address burnout with those folks, how we need to address the fact that, you know, people are doing this insurmount, some seemingly insurmountable task of trying to place people, trying to get people and nurture their mindset, but who's nurturing their mindset? who's actually taking care of and building and pouring into um, our practitioners. So in January, as you can see here, our peer learning session will be focused on embedding wellness in the workplace. And you'll have, when I share the deck, you will have the contact information for the gentleman who runs that. His name is Greg Watkins, and he is our, he is our uh, manager of Alliance the Rotary. So hopefully, I did not go too, too fast but we were running short on time and we wanna make sure that at least we get a couple questions. We obviously will be circulating throughout the day if you have additional questions or you wanna to talk to each other. Do we have time for like one or two questions, Julian? Okay, who's got a hand up? Hello. She's gonna make a comment? Yeah, on, I got who's another. Oh, good, okay. I know. Thank you very much. Um, we have been participating in that, and I just wanted to tell a quick story. Um, we were in this workshop, and it was talking about hiring the right candidates, and some of my staff was in one of the breakout groups, and I was in another. So when we came back together to talk about it, mm -hmm. they had been in one that was looking for a marketing manager. Mm -hmm. So I'm also in the process of hiring individuals, and when we did the breakout, we said, well, you know, for us, it isn't in the job description. They have to have um, a bachelor's degree or, or three or more years experience. Mm -hmm. And so one of my staff said to me, why? Mm. Because if the individual is on TikTok or Instagram or anything, and they might be younger, because I was like, well, that person would be too young. If they might be younger, but they have 4,000 followers, mm -hmm. obviously marketing 
is one of the, the things that they're able to do best. And, mm -hmm. and I, all of a sudden the epiphany came that, yeah, you know, I could stop looking at that. Now it's another thing for us to change our job description. It has to go before the board of directors and mm -hmm. all those things. But I ended up hiring a young lady, um, Mariah, Mariah, who is still with us and mm -hmm. she's a manager and doing a fabulous job. Mm -hmm. But it was removing the biases that you were talking about. And mm -hmm. it, it just never occurred to me as an employer, you know, that those things could be biases that are on the job description because you don't have a degree, because you aren't able, you haven't been in the workforce for X amount of years, mm -hmm. you know? And so it, it really is um, very insightful. I mean, we've gotten so much out of it, including uh, they created a piece for us in job coaching and emotional coaching. And mm -hmm. that that's huge to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We probably have one time for one more question if anyone has it. If not, if you want to ask Joy a question outside of the microphone use, we can, we can <laughs> she'll be here for three days. She will. <laughs> anyone with a question, thoughts, comments, more stories like Patricia's? Because like, I the question is, where's lunch, Julia? <laughs> lunch is coming no matter what. The, that's, that's what the faces are telling. They tell the truth. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I really enjoyed the peer learning network. So what does that really include? Like, mm -hmm. I was curious. Yes. So we initially started with our, our 10 sites, but we also invite them to invite whoever they are working with. So essentially, it's really like, what does this work look like in practice? Mm -hmm. We asked the site specifically, what should we be talking about? So we had one session that was on metrics, but metrics, not just the numbers, but I think, I can't remember who said it, but somebody said, I think it was a gentleman over here, data versus information, right? How do we make this information actionable? What does it really mean for our program? Mm -hmm. That's something everybody wanted to talk about. We've done one, and we'll be doing one next uh, spring on development and sustainable strategic fund development. So we'll do that. And usually, you know, we will have the agenda go out probably about a month in advance. We usually have them co-designed by some or all of the sites, either through survey or actually having like sub planning committees. Um, again, that those are free. You can register for those. The link to register for that, uh, the contact information for Greg, who's a gentleman who runs it, that will be in here. We welcome uh, folk to come. Uh, because while we have multiple uh, Unidos and Urban League sites, uh, we adore obviously our site in Patstone, but we don't have any other you know rural sites, and we certainly extend uh, the invite to y'all. And you know it really is a space to not just us talk to us talk to you about what we think the solutions are. It's us being responsive to what you're telling us we need to be talking about and we mm -hmm. need to be thinking through. And we actually. We get facilitators and we will facilitate, but the point is for us to talk as little as possible and for the practitioners to be able to have questions and kind of interrogate each other about what is working for you and you know, how long has this taken for you? Oh, great. You thought that this last thing that you learned from Skillful was great. You know, how are you implementing it? It's not just on the content. Um, it really is about what this work looks like in practice. And we think the best people to lead us in those conversations are the folks doing the work. Okay. I want to just add to that because I've been on a few of them and the, the one aha for me was they always seem to talk about scale because a lot of, and you've mentioned that in the room, a few of you are expanding programs rapidly or have new grants and there was some really great best practices on how people have scaled up without necessarily overburdening themselves or like mm -hmm. also being like really cognizant of their capacity because usually scale is like, oh, we'll hire another person, but that's like truly not always realistic. Um, well, and it's been really interesting to see how many different ways some of our peers have been able to scale without um, have, you know, getting too heavy on the top or just hiring someone whose job will disappear in two years when the grant's over mm -hmm. or like expanding their markets without, you know, you know, recognizing their capacity. It's been really, that's my aha from the peer learning menu. So mm -hmm. you get all sorts of conversations. So mm -hmm. um, for the sake of time, uh, thank you very much, Joy. Like we can all mm -hmm. thank Joy for her time. And uh, I saw a lot of you taking pictures of the links, but do not fear, I will send you the PowerPoint deck after this. So um, if you're, if you were shaking while taking your photo or you have an Android that was, that predates the millennium, like me, uh, there's better quality 
service for that. Um, and um, I do want to also make a really quick note to um, a few of you. We've had one-on-one -on -one conversations and we've talked a lot about Skillful and we had hoped to provide some kind of like inclusive training in the fall. We're still talking about it. So do not fear. We might have some really interesting ways to share with your employers and your communities and your coaches um, a kind of different way of, of incorporating skillful um, and learning from organizations like PASO and who've incorporated it. Cool. Um, I just want to do a couple of like agenda tweaks. We've had a few folks come in, so I'm going to kind of reset where we are. Um, a couple of funder, like fun people that I mentioned at the beginning, but now they're real are here. So I'm just going to give an opportunity for Justin Archer Birch, if you are familiar with this legend. Um, he's going to do some introductions, say a few words. How's everyone doing? Ooh, that was real close. I'm like five coffees in and three Diet Coke, so energy level is high and need you to meet me where I'm at. Um, sorry I wasn't here to see everybody and hug your necks this morning. We were at the, the White House meeting with the Office of um, Policy, Public Policy, and hopefully we'll have some fun announcements for you all in January. Uh, but I, I did want to just say hi to everyone and Hopefully I'll see you around at some point today. I do want to make a couple of recognitions. One, how incredible is Joy? I know that she had some time constraints there, but my God, like a brilliant workforce mind. If you are around the next three days, like find her, buy her wine and let her just talk. See, I'm setting you up for success this week. Scooch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I also want to recognize from Markle Family Foundation, Bill Turner. Bill, do you want to stand up? Bill is actually on an amazing panel later this week who will be talking about investments. And, you know, one of the great things that Markle Foundation and Rework America Alliance did from the very beginning was consider rural inclusion within this network. Um, so we have been so pleased to work with them. I also, Patricia, if you will stand up, Patricia has been, don't be shy on me now. But when we first launched this with Markle Foundation, Passed On and Patricia were one of the groups who just stood up and said, we're interested in being a demonstration site to create the proof points for the entire network. They have been killing it. So we have been loved working with them. And hopefully, you know, some of these things that we have been testing and, and figuring out um, she's been the guinea pig, but certainly we will be pushing some of those results out to everybody as we launch Skillful in a bigger and wider way. It's also where I think LISC is really looking to push um, this equity lens around workforce development is through some of Skillful's tools and, and what they're achieving um, nationally and ensuring that that has employer co-impact back to rural spaces. So we're super excited to see that. When we first launched Rural Works, you know, one of our really, really big bullets and, and sort of points that we wanted to make was, if we're going to do this, we want to go to places that's rural that intersects with BIPOC populations. So one of the things that really makes me happy is when I look around this room today, when we think about rural spaces, they're normally not this diverse. And that's a point of particular pride, I think, for Rural LISC as we move into Project 10X is to ensure that not only are we going rural, but we're going to persistent poverty communities that also represent Black, Latinx, and tribal. So I'm, I'm very excited to see that. The other person that I can't like sit down without acknowledging, Kirsten Nito, if you wanna stand up. So give her a double clap, if you will. So when Rural Works was just in ideation, you know, we were just spitballing. Um, Kirsten and her team at Ascendium Education Philanthropy were the, the sort of first group in who said, I'm willing to, to play ball with you. And because of their investment, we were able to make really big leverage points from a lot of different funders, whether that was the Mississippi groups under Walton Family Foundation, the Arkansas groups under Arconic, um, New York with Markle Foundation, and then some of the USDA dollars that have sort of been spread around the network. So, I mean, they, they really were this group who catalyzed the leveraging points, not only for the investments, but also the technical assistance that we've seen from Jobs for the Future and some of you who are working with Aspen Community Strategies. So when we link back to who really started it, 
Um, they, they were that first in funder and you always need those. So they have been a tremendous advocate and a dot connector for us. And I think she'll be with us the entire week too. Yes. So feel free to pick her brain. And I know she will be on the panel with Bill later in the week. Um, so I know lots of good things will come from that. I do not want to keep anybody from lunch. So I will pass the mic back on to you, but it's so good to see you all. And I promise I'll come hug your neck because I need my hug from Juanita to get this day started. <laughs> I will also, yeah, yeah, just, um, I also want to say, um, we are going to hear a little bit from Kristen later, so do not fear, we did not forget that, just a bit, but I did not, um, but we are going to give you like a five minute bio break to run to the restroom while we reset for, for lunch, for those of you online, uh, I think for some of you, it's not lunchtime, but feel free to eat whenever you want. Um, but if you want to just kind of like stretch your legs a little, run to the restroom. I get there's one by the elevator. There's one over here, but there's stairs. Um, and be back in about five minutes if possible. And hopefully we will have some food here and then we'll have a little bit of a working lunch while we do some discussion questions. Um, yeah, so five minutes, bio break, take care of your bodies before we feed it. You can leave your stuff here. I will be here and I will fight people to the death to protect your laptop.
Um, so this is a full of updates. Yeah. Uh, Still actually. But you can't. Okay. Actually, it's a full moon. So, much like Mercury, I'm just blaming it on the uh, So, we have uh, Emily and Justin share a little bit of updates what's going on. Uh, we're going to have some share some client success. We've already heard a couple, but we're getting into the interview. So, I can't wait to hear some more. Uh, and then, we're going to do some of the sustainable class discussions and topics that we're going to share. Um, and we're going to have these subjects in the room, but we're going to have them online and they're going to be subscribed to us. Um, so from here, I will pass the mic to Emily. I feel like I, oh, I'm like, I swear Justin is here a second ago, but I'm looking all over the room and Justin is nowhere to be found. You didn't recognize my bald spot? No, I did not recognize your bald spot. And um, apologies for the use of my phone. I'm trying to make sure lovely virtual participants can hear us as well, um, which sounds like they can. So, um, so for those of you who weren't here earlier, my name is Emily Avery. I'm the director of alignment for Rural Risk and also oversee the Rural Financial Opportunity Center network. Um, we chose this year to do a pre-session where we combine both of our rural works groups and our FOC groups because some of them play a dual role. Um, raise your hand if you're an FOC and a rural work site. So there's a few people around the room who are both, um, which has been really great because it allows us to um, really look at opportunities inside rural lists to figure out how we best support those partners who are running multiple programs across um their organizations and we've had lots of lessons learned over the last year so thanks for being our guinea pigs in that um all of you raise your hand it's been really great um so over the last year our focs um, we now have 18 across the network and they've served a little over 1200 individuals with that um, integrated financial and employment coaching service um, and again, have learned lots of things. There's um, a little over 530 who have met a key outcome, which is um, through the system, it shows an increase in net income, net worth, um, job retention, job placement, um, or a credit score increase. So, um, you know, a, a huge number of them have really succeeded through those programs for um, probably a little bit of what Joe was saying earlier about his program and how some of that integration works. So really proud of our FOC network, really grateful that you all are here and that we're able to bring all of these great minds together. So looking forward to hearing the discussion. <clears throat> Um, and if you couldn't tell, I'm a minister, so I'm glad you just get to me. We grew up in the South, but I'm the top of So, one of the things we have been discussing this year is really how we can integrate these models. So, whether you're a full work site, whether you're a financial opportunity center, or maybe a print site, so like how can we bring some more of this together? If you have been in full works, we did more of the for my own jobs. So what are you doing in terms of your technical training? What are you doing to try to go to a public publish job? Is there a public-private partnership there that's a funding collaborative that can sort of aggregate all this together? Um, and really how do we process some of these national knowledge? Financial opportunity centers have done a really awesome job in terms of an equity reach. Um, when we talk about doing some integrated services, so whether that uh, are you banking and how you provide like uh, your checking account, what is your credit score, how we get it to play with the negative access capital. Um, and even to the very side, we have done some, some really quality, we're happily building around certain employers with a place 
So we're launching some like social strategies within labor market areas. But one of the things we noticed, especially from the community who are doing one of the two, two of the two, three of the two, is there's nothing left to be learned and certainly really different things to be done. So one of our big focuses this year is really figuring out how we integrate into and make it a more simplified process. Um, some of you, and I think for us, it's really about living in the community. Some of you may just want to get one item off the site, new item. Some of you have moved to a board. Some of you have moved to a board. But really figuring out how we scale localized solutions to your communities to meet the needs of the clients who are high flying. So I know that Emily and Francesca, who is joining us online, everyone wave hi to Francesca. Yeah, so those of you who are at those of Bridge of Science, those are just in her amazing work. But we will be making some coming in help of uh, really figuring out how to be the right side and business programming based on the localized community um, and how we better pipeline and endowment to your community around us. So we're very interested in having sit downs with you over the next few days, but of course, we'll also be scheduling one on one appointments. With each side, so it's really good to the reason to dive down to the So that'll be part of the conversations that we have um, that are upcoming, but definitely for an exciting announcement for the one I think for our small programming, um, but figuring out how we can switch it to the system. So I, I think that is some forthcoming knowledge. Um, we will be not only making the reach out, but seeing out some formal notifications that are still in draft order. But I think some really big really positive things are coming down the pipe, not only from the nonprofit sector, but also from the public sector. I think there's been a real recognition of the developed work over the last two years and how we met the community. So we're coming up on our third year, and that was our original commitment to you for three years. So figuring out I just love to see how we and where we can go. Beyond the sectorial strategy, I know one of the big things that we're interested in over the next year is the community model. Uh, and again, that that's how we're plugging in with Marvel. Um, some of the other conversations that we are really starting to do in one is how do we deploy a stronger employer management model? So, really looking at employer over impact. So, maybe that's direct investment into your collaborative, not always using the regulatory model. Like a little bit of that, how do we grow your capacity there? How do we get them engaged around what it's learned models? So, whether that's for us, the gold standard, the LSP, the other friendship, but in those rural communities, we need to understand that we can probably be in the industry of friendship and probably in the future model, but how do we scale that? And how do we figure out the gateways of those in the future ladders and engage them into you know, some sort of system that's paying you while you want? Because most of us know that the people who are from the large system have commitments, they have bills, they have families, and you can't necessarily take those from the east to go over a predation. How do we figure out how to do So, those are just some of the ideations that we're working on. We definitely are consistent with the ideas um, and how we're looking at scaling the product in this community and how we can plug it. But um, with that, I just want to pause. And see if there's any kind of questions on the community when it comes to the board and how we can just wait for it. Seeing none, I hear the one for this. So I will pass the mic on to the opinion or to go back to Emily. So I'm going to pass the mic back on to the opinion. I stood up the thank you, Brad. Who's trying to settle the book? Oh, wrap it up. Yeah. Um, okay. So the rest of the lunch is really just an opportunity for you all to um, share with each other, to talk with each other. We have five questions that we're going to put up on the screen um, shortly that you all can just kind of share some of your best employer engagement practices, um, ways that you all are um, doing workforce and small business um, work really well in your communities. Um, and we wanted to offer an opportunity, not for too long, because I know you all are trying to compete, um, but to share some client success stories. 
Uh, we had a couple weeks ago, I think Paul mentioned it, we worked together in Appalachia um, and had just a really great um, networking session reception at night where everybody shared a client success story. Um, and it was just really inspiring to hear all the incredible work you all are doing with individuals. Um, and so would love to hear if there's anybody in the room who wants to share maybe one or two success stories. And that's for virtual participants as well. Um, feel free to raise your hand and we can take you off mute and make sure that you have the opportunity to share as well. So any success stories that you want to share? I want to you don't need to share anything. Okay, I just know you. In general, so building out the sustainability in the cloud is a separate everybody. For the Mississippi Delta, one of the things we really have concentrated on was criminalization policy. And we all have our like personal passion projects. My personal is returning to the city to go to my team. But we recently spotlighted some of the national deaths that are nowhere in this part of the sky. I mean, I read about it on my That's not easy. That kind of touched my heart. Can you share your story? Hello, everyone. Uh, you grew up in church. <laughs> Hello okay, everyone, I have been Jonathan Malone with the last week I'm going to come around to the radio community. And with the re-entry of the expungement, we had a group whose name was Michonne Brooks. Um, I don't know who I'll call him real yet, but we need to find out his story. Uh, he came into it, he was a single uh, father, he had two kids, and uh, he had been in the justice system. So with that, it was so hard for him to find work. So uh, the work of the Washington County Economic you know, Alliance, we believe in that people have to take a chance. So we don't call you a criminal, we don't call you an attorney citizen. So with that, we came in and we started with the expungement plan. And with the expungement plan, we had over 98 citizens that actually come in. It was actually more, but it was very low on the uh, actual attorneys at the moment. So we only did the 98. And with that, Mr. Brooks came in, he uh, got his record expunged. So he was able to actually go into the work for So that's what with that. Uh, the WCA, we partnered with local employers to actually hire an attorney. So we go in and say, hey, how are you feel about the attorney citizen? Is there anything that we can do to help you all to make it work? So that's, everyone was on board with that. So we found him and he was very excited. He scared at first. He was like, I'm going to be one of my business. I'm like, look, man, we're not going to do anything like you don't even have to scare me with your charges or anything. I just want to be able to get your records plunged and actually help you to so provide for your family. So he got his records plunged. He went through the uh, CAP, which is our local MDPC local community college that provides work for Shiner. He went through the uh, Actually, he took a couple of things. He did form protect, he did CDL, and now he is currently enrolled in form uh, in the EMC class, which is the immersion technician program. And uh, he, once he finished those program, he actually did a job in that field, but he's actually in school. So he actually, uh, he have a teacher's license. He's on immersion license where he teaches, he teaches third grade. So he was very excited for that, and he got his birthday and he was actually for the class of his family. So he definitely taking up all the tools and resources that we offer at the end of the day to their family. So. Thank you. And it's one of those conversations that, you know, it's, it's crazy to me when we get into some of the meetings with our So, what are those persistent barriers within the community? So LaShawn's story was very interesting to me because he was tech of transition. Young black man in the Delta who wanted a healthcare career could not go into the training or employment because he had to be right. When he sat down with the expungement clinic, you know what it's like? He had to pay the rent. That man was kept out of the workforce system for years because he didn't have the money. To go pay so he sat down in an expungement clinic, and within an hour, those papers were submitted to a county clerk, which expunged the record, cleaned it, and then he could go into it. I mean, that, it's crazy little points like that. Um, that I, you know, it's just always sort of amazing to me when we're having this. Program. So, who else? Anyone else have a success story? 
I knew y'all. <laughs> yeah. Um, once again, my name is Kevin Taylor. I am the Community Outreach Station for Legacy Institute. Um, and as we were sitting here during the course, I received a call from one of our clients. Um, and he just informed us that he just received his baby equipment operation certification. Um, he was a young man that came, said the father didn't know which way he was going to go. He was impressed, and uh, it was a bit of a journey, but I uh, said that he was true, kind of lived around him, and he knew he had great children. So he just called to just say, Hey, I thank you guys, I love you guys, and he's going to, he said, He's going to go out and tell everybody we can be a part of the programs and the opportunities that we in the world, straight for life. So that's a great win for us for the young man to be certified. Thank you for the way for us. We move on to here. I am Echo from Monroe, Louisiana, from uh, Nova, and I am the FOC over there. And then I also do the recruiting, I also do the uh, preparation classes. And so with that being said, we actually have individuals that come through um, our program that we teach every service that we actually teach. And um, recently we held a career readiness training class. And um, a young lady, she was coming through and she was actually living in her car. And we had to, she was living in her car until we started having conversations. You know, everything is built off a conversation, everything is built around communication, everything is built around trust. And so she um, was letting me know that um, she was coming to class and she was actually shopping in a uh, back on downstairs, you know, like another thing, teacher. And so we got in touch with another one of our partners to actually help her get started. With uh, when it got there, because she had no clue about credit. Okay, she had no clue what credit was, how to utilize it. She didn't even know what word credit means. So, at the day, the person where they are. And so, we just started having that conversation again based around let's start from the bottom, let's see exactly what it is that we can teach you within the time frame that you're with us. So, after that, she began to start working on establishing credit because she was right. She never utilized it, so she had it. So we um, partnered up with one of our local uh, financial institutions right in our town, and they actually had it whereas any individual that comes through our program is able to get a free credit check through them because we partnered with them. And um, they started showing her a little bit more, teaching her a little bit more about her credit. And we actually assisted her with getting a job and also a uh, certification. So she was starting off at making $8,000. So she's actually making $15 an hour. This is kind of a little paper that we were able to assist her with getting. And also, she did her treatment car. Just from saving through the FOC, helping her with her savings plan, and she purchased a cash car, and we actually had a meet and greet, and we introduced her at our meet and greet on the last night. So. Thank you so much. So, uh, as Emily mentioned, there's a couple of questions up here that we would love to all to discuss because the division tables are just being served. Um, so again, share your best employee engagement strategy, the aha moments, favorite workforce stealing tool, your best plan for recruitment strategy, and successful partnership that's helped um, advance the workforce strategy. 
So if you will just get to know each other around your tables, go around and discuss, and it's okay if you don't get to all five questions, but just begin the conversation. Let's figure out what maybe we can elevate from the next. Enjoy lunch. We'll put it on. Hi everyone, nice to see all of our virtual attendees here. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Please let me know if you can't. <laughs> we can hear you. Awesome. Hi Brooke, how are you? I am good. How are you? Good, good. Just here, hanging out virtually, enjoying the, in the seminar. <laughs> Same. Yes. Cool. Well, it's nice to see some other folks here who have joined. Thank you for attending this networking lunch. Um, I know it's kind of an interesting setup, but I'm really happy that we're able to integrate this virtual component. I know not everyone can make it, and plus, Sometimes it's just better to, to join virtually, especially for folks who just have tougher schedules. So please feel free to take up space here. This is a virtual event just as much as it is an in-person event. Um, I know it's probably a little tougher for us to get that connection, but ultimately we've still got some good questions here that we can engage with. So please feel free to take up space. Um, I think you can probably see Emily's screen here. It looks like she did share some of the questions here. So these are the same questions that everyone is kind of connecting with in person. Um, I'm just going to throw them out here. So if you want to just either in the chat or just here, feel free to take yourself off mute and we can just kind of casually engage. I know there's a couple of different questions here, so feel free to take them as they come. I think they're starting off with sharing your best employee engagement strategy. But if there's one in particular that kind of pops out to you that you maybe want to touch on, feel free to just take up space here because that's what it's for. But touching on this first one, does anyone have any any employee engagement strategies? Especially, I know things have been kind of challenging over the past year. I mean, really since the beginning of COVID and even prior to that, but things have definitely changed a lot in terms of strategy. I've heard a lot from all of our sites about different avenues that you're exploring, things that you've totally changed since becoming an FOC to dealing with COVID. So I'm just curious if there's anything that has changed that you can think of off the top of your head that you want to share either in the chat or again in person or virtually, I should say, if you're going to take yourself off mute. I'm definitely interested in um, employee engagement strategies and hearing ideas. Um, most recently, we have looked at job descriptions and really pushed more towards that skills-based hiring 
um, do, do, do they need a bachelor's degree? You know, if the answer is no, um, you know, because if only if only a handful of our positions really require it under regulations, like our Head Start teachers are required by federal regs to have a bachelor's degree in early childhood. Um, otherwise, it's really it's really about what's up to us, right? And and we know on the job training is so incredibly valuable um, that you know, we, we found in the past that we probably were screening out people that would have been good fits and could have learned on the job. Um, and just because, you know, they didn't have the degree, it, it, it didn't mean that they weren't a good fit. So um, I have seen just in the past week, um, a few more applications than we've seen for, we've had an open financial opportunity coach position in Boone County for five months. Um, or more, and that's our largest county. Um, and it's, it's a very, very large city, Columbia, um, for the state of Missouri anyway. Um, and so that's really hard when you have two or three applications in an entire month for a position. We've looked at pay scale, we've increased pay, starting pay. Um, we've been flexible with scheduling and uh, you know, hybrid work schedules. And it really, any ideas that someone you know, can come up with, it's like, yeah, if that will work, if we can put this in the job description that we can, you know, can be flexible or there's work for home opportunities, it's going to bring in, in more applicants. Um, for a completely unrelated position, I posted it at $3 more an hour than we typically pay and part-time 26 hours a week, temporary, six months or less, and had more applications in the first day than we knew what to do with. Um, the same thing happened when we posted a second, completely different job, completely different type of work the same way. And so that makes me really wonder is, just the whole landscape of full-time employment no longer a necessity for people. Um, do they want that flexibility uh, with balancing home life, family life, whatever it might be, and they're willing to give up the benefits side? Because health insurance doesn't come with 26 hours a week for our agency. And so I was able to increase the hourly rate because I'm not paying a benefits package, right? Our benefits package is, is a lot. It's a lot of money that our agency puts in. That's no longer the same kind of draw that it was five or 10 years ago when I was hiring. Um, people were always so impressed with our paid time off and, um, you know, 13 paid holidays and, um, you know, all, all the things. It, it, health insurance being basically fully paid by the employer still, that's not enough for full-time employees. And so I don't know what to do because it's not like the grant funding is increasing and inflation, cost of living. I run all of our energy programs, 30% increase in natural gas and propane has thousands of more customers at our door, not hundreds, thousands. So I, I don't know the answer. I know people need to pay bills. I know that the, the need is there, but is it because of also having the need for flexibility or um, I, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm definitely open to any kind of ideas and being innovative around finding solutions. Um, that's what we're about <laughs> at Central Missouri Community Action. We're all about being innovative and trying to find solutions. Um, but leadership team just met yesterday and um, we're somewhat tapped out. Like we really, we just opened two new positions taking off degree requirements yesterday. Um, We've already seen more applicants, so that's great. Um, but it's still not, we're still not seeing what we need to. So any suggestions that are helpful on employee engagement specifically? Definitely. Thank you for sharing, Brooke. Oh my gosh, and I, you don't have all the answers. I was really thinking that you would definitely come today prepared with all the answers for, <laughs> for navigating this new workforce um, and labor force. No, I'm, I'm just kidding though. I, no, I, I hear you and I feel like I've heard a lot of um, similar similar stories from, from our rural FOC specifically. I know we've got quite a few here that are able to join us. 
Has anyone else experienced or has encountered some of the same kind of issues that CMC is, is seeing here, navigating this new workforce and kind of reevaluating skill, reevaluating some of the um, requirements for a job, and even some of the conversations that you're having with employers. I know we've got some of our really strong workforce agencies here who are partnered with employers. I wonder how those conversations are also going because it's one thing for your sites to really be um, exploratory and trying your best to incorporate some of these new employee engagement strategies, but when they're not being um, supported and when that, that same exploratory and innovative nature isn't shared with some of the local workforce partners um, and employers, that can be really difficult as well. Um, so I'm just curious if there's anyone else here that wants to share either, you know, in the chat, feel free to just jump in here or take up space here. This is super casual. We're not doing anything too crazy, but I'd love to hear more from some of the other virtual attendees. If possible, I think I'll jump in here uh, real quick. Samantha with Clinch Pal. Um, we are obviously very rural as well. We're in East Tennessee, so we service a lot of counties. So when we try to advertise a position, um, work from home remote positions are very, very hard to come by, um, especially in our field here. I personally do a lot of you know, traveling to see my clients, depending on the program just because transportation, technology issues. So one of the things that I've noticed personally um, is because since we don't offer a lot of virtual employment options, we have a hard time getting people through the door. And one of the things about Clinch Powell as well is almost every staff member starts as an AmeriCorps member. And if anybody here knows anything about AmeriCorps, um, the pay on AmeriCorps is rather difficult to be able to live on, especially in today's environment. I am still actively an AmeriCorps member and have been for the past three years, so I can understand those struggles. And working in the FOC, helping these clients, you know, helping them understand that employment options, especially in rural Tennessee, finding something that pays over $8 is incredibly hard. And um, our rental prices have soared way beyond any of us would ever expect. We used to have um, one bedrooms going for like $250, $300, and now they're up climbing towards the $800, $900. So those employment options for us being able to offer an employment uh, position here, it's very hard given, you know, having to pay so much. And with AmeriCorps, one of the big things about it is that the host agency can give an additional stipend, but you can only give so much before it becomes like a violation of your AmeriCorps contract. So when we hire, we always start with AmeriCorps because if anybody here has ever done AmeriCorps, you know, that kind of uh, weeds out the people that aren't committed to the kind of work that we do. So that's one of the ways that we've started. And we've had many positions that have been open. I personally actually just transitioned into our lending department as well, because we were having such a hard time finding somebody that would be able to work in our lending department because nobody wanted to apply. There was nobody that wanted to come to the office. Nobody wants to leave their home, especially here unless you're getting paid outrageously, which is hard in itself to find. So the perks of rural wearing multiple hats. <laughs> so that is really fascinating and basically brilliant. I have never before thought of AmeriCorps for FOC um, employment. And that is that that is so smart. Um, we actually are in the past six months um certified as an AmeriCorps agency now and so I think I need to explore this further um do you mind if I email you like can you share that in chat or something where I could reach out to you directly maybe we can have a conversation I that is so thank you for sharing that if I only take away that from today it's a win so thank you 
Yeah, absolutely. I will send you my email. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions about it. I'm happy to talk. Thank you so much. Definitely. Ditto. Thank you so much, Samantha, for sharing. Um, I really appreciate your, your insight and definitely encourage. I know we've got some other folks here, um, also from some of our, our newer FOC. I know we've got um, NCUS here, and I think I see Annette Brown on the call. Just wanted to give a little shout out and say hi. And as a, as a new FOC, someone who is joining this rural network here, I love any initial insights that you have, especially from your agency. I know you work um, very heavily in workforce. You've got a lot of folks who were consistently coming to your org and now you're integrating the FOC. If you have any insights, we'd, we'd love to hear them, Annette, um, and feel free to drop them in the chat or feel free to take yourself off mute. And this goes for anyone else who wants to jump on. If you have any similar issues that you've been exploring, um, new recruitment strategies, new conversations that you're having with workforce um, employers in the area, local workforce employers, and also just the funding partners, you know, including you know similar peer peer organizations like LIST, how you're framing this issue and any creative solutions um, that you may be encountering. We'd love to hear more insights. Looks like we might have tapped out Every, <laughs> everyone here, which is totally okay. But feel free again to take up space. This is a, a virtual event, just as much as it is in person. And this is just casual conversation, um, really just engaging some of these really crucial topics that I know every single one of our FOC has been challenged with. And I'm gonna touch back over here and see where we're at. Oh, oh sorry, go ahead, Brooke. I was wondering, I don't know how much time we have, Francesca, but if there's anyone um, that can speak to blending the roles of FOC and career coach, I'm definitely interested in hearing like success for, um, if, if anybody feels like they have a really successful model um, with the employment and financial coaching happening um, with the same person on a regular basis. Definitely great question. Does anyone have any insight that they want to share? You know, we've got a lot of resident experts here on the virtual call. Feel free again, just take yourself off you or raise your, your uh, comments in the chat. I'll be brave. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, All right, this is I'm Sue Wagner from Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Um, funny that you ask about blended and, and trying to get someone to do the same, no, both skills. Um, we started out limited staffing and um, I attempted as best I could to be able to do that. My strength is much more the employment and training piece. And so employment coaching is, is a cinch. Um, goals involving training and moving on are, are good. Uh, when we hired a full-time financial coach, everything blossomed. To know that there would be somebody who could dedicate their time and effort uh, and guidance with the clients, knowing full well that employment coaching was going to be tied in, and that's when he would tap me. And I'd come in and say, Let's talk about the employment. You, you're talking about wanting to get, grow your income. You're talking about wanting another job or at least looking to the future for a new job. It was, it was wonderful. I very much love having that distinction of um, two people providing the service in a heartbeat. Could I, could I go back and do it if need be? Yeah, but I really just love the fact that we have a full-time financial coach now. So if someone else on, on the call can talk about blending that more, please, I just am going to shout out for the joy of having a full-time financial coach here. <laughs> I appreciate that insight yeah, in really all areas of it, because right now we do have them separate. And so hearing, you know, successes or struggles either way is very helpful. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Sue. And I, yeah, I, I've heard a lot as well that having very distinct roles, even though it's a challenge, a lot of times to even get that option, really, you know, helps tremendously with the work, the workload capacity, the able, the ability to uh, really hone in on a specific 
um, type of work as opposed to being switched between, you know, working with different programs, managing different projects and having different clients who are needing different needs. Um, and I just got a little comment here in the chat from Sandra. Thank you for sharing. Sandra says, we don't have enough bodies, so our financial coaches also do employment coaching. Often the clients are working towards goals in both areas anyways. Thank you for sharing, Sandra, and that's that's very true. Um, so I'm, I know we, thank you guys for sharing and taking up space here in the virtual chat. I'm just gonna check in and see where we're at with the in-person just to make sure we're on target. So give me just a quick second here. Please, please do not hesitate to reach out. We'd love to learn more about you and the work you're doing with your communities on the ground. So, uh, thank you again for coming and let's have a great summer. Take care. Good morning. Good time. We're going to call it. So we introduced these during the beginning of the conversation, but we really wanted to invite us in, you know, again as you know, someone who sponsored this seminar and someone who was sort of first in on this work to really elevate their own thoughts, their own theory of change, what they're thinking about the way they rule in their kind of and So everyone, please just give her a huge round of applause. You know, I can be happy for that. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Richard Pineda from Ascendian. Um, I just want to start off by saying I am so excited to be here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, who Ascendian is in just a minute, but you should know that um, the, the rural focus of uh, philanthropic efforts that we do, we launched that work in 2019. Um, and rural lists and this work was one of the first projects that we funded in April of 2020. And y'all know what happened shortly after that. And so, Justin, I can't believe I'm actually meeting you in person. Like, I don't know how many hours we've spent on the phone and how uh, much I have heard about all of your great work through virtual meetings and meetings, but uh, it is an absolute pleasure and joy to be here. Um, with all of you. So thank you so much for taking the time. Um, and thank you to Justin and Julianne and the entire Ruralist team for, um, I know, the tremendous amount of work that goes into uh, planning and executing a community like this. Um, as Justin mentioned earlier, um, Bill and I, and Bill, also so nice to meet you in person. It's like so great to be with you. Um, we're going to be on a panel um, on Friday. And so I, I will say kind of the longer spiel about this NBM. Um, for then, but just a few things that um, I'd love for you to know about Ascendium. Um, so we are a national philanthropic organization based in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I call Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, my home. Or anybody that's been to the Lake City. Um, and we have four years been very focused on a single mission, and that is to ensure that more learners from low-income backgrounds are able to earn a degree or credential that provides them with a path to upward uh, socioeconomic mobility. Uh, in 2019, we went through a process to completely redo our grant making strategy. And one of the things that emerged from that work was a, a focus on uh, rural communities. And that work, uh, and that, that particular focus in our strategy was very intentional and very much driven by the data. We know that rural learners uh, 
are uh, less likely to um, earn a degree or financial uh, compared to their urban or suburban peers. Um, and we also know that there is a tremendous gap in the amount of philanthropic dollars that go to urban and suburban communities compared to rural communities. We should do the choir. That's not anything new um, that y'all don't already know. And so I was thinking that we realized that if we really wanted to be serious about our mission um, for equity, we couldn't forget about 25 or 20% of the population that identifies itself as well. And so that's um, uh, deeply ingrained into the work that we do, and I think the important part of our equity strategy is making sure that um, we're, we're lifting up uh, the assets of rural communities and really providing investments in rural places that have um, so often been overlooked. And so in our grant making, we just focus on um, a number of strategies. We have really been focused on research. There's a lack of research about what works for rural learners and rural institutions and rural workforce organizations. And so we're really trying to fill that gap. Um, we're also trying to work with institutions to help scale up best practices and reform strategies that we know have been implemented in urban and suburban places. Um, and many rural institutions and organizations just haven't had the resources um, to implement those. And so we're trying to figure out how to get those resources into your hands and then how do we help to speak, but to tweak the best practices that we know work to make sure that in a rural environment you can't just take something that works in urban and then drop it into rural. Um, and this work, this, this work with rural works and really trying to find uh, partnerships between institutions, workforce organizations, economic development, all of those key stakeholders that play a really critical role in supporting entire communities and individuals. Um, this is, that's like a critical part of what we do. Um, I have a background in um, you know, being a, a collective impact organization um, in southeastern Wisconsin. And so this work of collaboration, I know firsthand, is not for the front, um, and it's very complex, but it is so deeply important. Um, and so we are so proud to be supporting the work that you do um, each and every day. Um, and I look forward to this meeting. Um, more of you um, and having a chance to get to know more about the great work that you're doing in your communities um, over the next few days. So thank you again um, to the World Let's Team uh, for organizing this event and thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we keep plugging these sessions even though I know you're going to watch every single one of them. But I think we're trying to say that ours are going to be the best ones, but also if you plan the most of uh, but uh, we're going to wrap up the lunch portion. I do want to recognize two rural staffers, rural staffers who also joined us for lunch. But Courtney Beckles and Jason Lee have been incredibly welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Village to support our village. So thank you all uh, for uh, the two meeting. I don't know if this is right, but it's spread right, but it feels um, but what we're going to do now is if you are at World Work Sites um, only and want to take off the rest of the afternoon, that's fine. If you want to stay for another about hour of uh, conversation uh, that the Emily and Francesca are going to be, um, if you're interested in staying, it's going to be a fast fast. And we did want to include this little demarcation point if you wanted to leave. Um, but um, if you don't, if you do leave and you wanted some uh, time to talk to Beth and I about your World Works program or funding or whatever, we are also here for that. Um, also, we will be collecting for, it's in this email, but we're trying to collect some thoughts from you for videos to show on the internet. Um, why do we next year? Um, we have to have three, video, three questions in the agenda. Um, but if you are interested in doing that, I would love to hear from you at the end of today, um, end of this meeting, so I can capture you and on my phone because we are there. And uh, <laughs> well, we were talking about that marketing person who just moved on my phone. Um, and you will be really appreciate it when we able to just really quick three questions, just to keep going in a few minutes. Um, and I promise to make you look people intelligent. Just like you are. Um, with that, I will hand over to Emily.
I think we'll take a five minute break actually. That way people have the opportunity to go if you want to go and we won't call you out if you go. Um, I won't be like, I won't be like Joy's walking out. Joy's walking out right now. I don't, we don't know why, but she's leaving. So, so um, five minutes. So 12, 15 is a central time. 12, 15 central time on your clock still. So one fifteen, right? I'll go back and just buy the elevators. Yeah. I'm over here upstairs. We just can't forget to unmute this.
All right, can y'all hear me virtually? There's Francesca, great. Uh, and there was a request to point you toward the speaker, so I'm going to attempt to do that. We'll see if that helps. I'll try and see. Is that better? Good? Great. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started on that FMC portion. So um, it looks like we still have a pretty good group here. So I think we're good. Great. Um, all right, well, uh, again, Emily Avery, for those of you who don't know me, totally long by now. Um, and uh, we'll just talk a little bit about the history of the FOC, and then we're going to dive into um, just doing a little um, listening session around um, kind of where do we go from here and what can we help provide for you. Um, so, as Justin said earlier, the FOC uh, model is has been around for over 15 years um, under the list umbrella, but for the rural network, it's really only been around for about three years, a little over three years in a formal way. Um, and what we really made a commitment to with the FOC network is that we were going to try and raise funds for at least three years of seed funding for FOCs, and then we were going to cross our fingers and hope that by then there would be lots of new leverage funding and new partnership, and um, the FOC model would really be integrated into the organizations. Um, that worked really well for some organizations, and of course it didn't work um, as well for some organizations. And so we're at a point now where we're really trying to figure out um, where are our FOCs most successful? Is it in that workforce space? Is it in that housing space? Who are some of those really strong strategic partners that have come in to help sustain these FOC models more than others? And how do we really help to share that across the network so all of our FOCs can be strong? So um, we have, again, 18 FOCs right now with a very long waiting list of additional FOCs that are ready to come into the network. Um, and so what we're exploring is this idea of an affiliate network, where as you all have kind of graduated into that fourth year, if Salesforce is not helpful for your organization, which for some people is very helpful, for others it's a bit of a burden, which I'm sure we, uh, I've talked to you all many times about that. Um, if it's not helpful, then we're really looking at a way to still keep you part of rural lists financial opportunities in your network, but to um, allow you to move away from that Salesforce component. And so we're trying to figure out, and we love your help over the next few months, really designing what that looks like. We still want you to be able to get technical technical assistance and resources from us as those come up, like some of the ones you all heard today. Um, just because you're part of the rural list network, you'll get access to some of those resources. So it doesn't mean you have to be a formal FOC in order to get that. Um, again, for some organizations, being a formal FOC matters more than for others. And so that's really important to us too, is just making sure that, again, we're not taking anything away from you that would help put you in a position to really be able to deliver those services uh, in the best way possible. So um, again, no formal decisions. It's not going to be made overnight, but it is some of the that's some of the kind of foundation of these listening sessions that we're having right now. Is just figuring out, you know, again, how can we be most helpful in making sure that you can deliver this integrated service, um, these financial coaching um, services through some of your workforce programming, or again through some of your um, housing programming. So I'll pause there and see if there are any questions, and then we'll move into some more. Um, questions about that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big potential change. So it's not gonna Don't be afraid to ask questions. Stop answering. Yeah. Yeah. We're not moving away from it. So Salesforce will continue as long as the FOC network exists. Um, so if you're an FOC with us for 10 years, you can have access to that at no cost, right? Hopefully, I mean, that's, 
And we, we have not heard otherwise, right? So our national listing actually pays for up to five licenses um, for sales purposes, as we know. Um, and that will continue as long as you're putting data in the system. Um, if you're not putting a lot of data in the system, your numbers are relatively low. Um, or again, we've heard from you that it's really hard to manage multiple systems. Um, and it, you, you know, you're not capturing the data the way um, you want to capture the data, right? It's not reflecting what you're actually doing. Then that's when this conversation becomes important is um, we don't want to require you to use Salesforce, especially if there isn't funding past that three-year mark. Um, and so how do we really still help support you in the network um, without requiring that Salesforce component? But still making sure we're capturing some of the great work you're doing and sharing that with some of our great, you know, national partners that we have. So Emily, so if you're if you're considering moving from Salesforce or we think that it's not a helpful edge behind you, are you coming up with some other system, putting that in place to help capture that information? Yeah, so what we're we we likely will not create another system like Salesforce because it's an incredibly robust system that is used by all 130 plus SLPs across the country. Um, so what we would likely do is instead get some aggregate information from you and just you know more look at more of um, how many clients are you still serving? Is their income increasing? Are they getting, you know, do you have job placements? And we're just asking you to pull from your existing system that you have on site to tell us some of the work that you're doing. So we'll rely more on your data systems that you currently have. And again, the important thing is, is if you do not have a way to track some of those really key outcomes that we track, then we don't want you to use we want to try and make sure that that we can still make that work for you, but that's not the case for everybody. Like, I mean, not the call people in general, but you know, people like this for example, right? They have robust data systems that they can track everything and more that we're asking them. And so, does it make sense to add another system if it if there may be another way for us to engage them in that financial coaching? Because it's kind of like us, you know, we're still so new to this procedure. Yeah. And but we're learning as we go. And so we're experiencing the challenges. And so Ashley here is our FOC coordinator. And so she, you know, she she's done an amazing job with all of the um webinars and seminars and collecting data and all of that. But I think, uh, as far as we're concerned, we're still going to get a name to have us. I mean, the um, sales force to have us see the data. It's, it's been helpful for us because of the magnitude of data that's there and helping us with our workforce partner as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is the case for, you know, at least half of our network has said, please don't do sales force from us, right? And we won't. We're, we don't plan on taking sales force if it's helpful because. That's the whole point, right? Is that we can bring in some of these um, best practice tools and systems and help you, um, you know, deliver a better service by by looking at some of that data. Um, so, you know, again, it's more for if you know we ask that by year three of an FOC, you're serving seventy five, at least seventy five individuals in the system. And if it's been hard for people to get to that number, then we need to start understanding why. And if it is the system, or and you're really serving 75 people, it's just not getting in the system, or if it's something else. Um, and so again, we're just really exploring how do we not lose our full, you know, all of these incredible organizations that have been part of our network for so long now. How do we not lose connection to them and resources for them? And, um, you know, partnerships, um, but at the same time, not put so much of a burden to get to those numbers. Because, you know, we have, we are seen by our national team, they can see all of the data in the system, right? They can see that aggregate level data. And so we have to answer their questions, like why are there only 30 clients in the system and there should be more. Um, and again, a lot of times it's not even that, the organizations aren't doing the work, it's that the data is not getting into the system because they don't have the capacity to get it in the system the right way. 
And so we're trying to see if it's that what we see. Other questions? All right. I'm only being a little bit right. Let's see. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to do just a little um, conversation. I Again, as we start to kind of develop what this looks like in the future, um, I'm going to start with what was the most helpful thing about being part of the FOC network this year? I did take this step. Who wants to start? Well, I would say the most helpful thing about being part of the FOC network this year for me, um, especially because this is my first year, would be the support. Having um, Francesca, especially there, to guide me along the way, and then being um, some peers uh, to collaborate with, and just have that um, moment to where if I didn't understand something hard, I needed a workaround method that they were right there, literally saying, we tried this. Great. Thank you. Others? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll just say that um, our agency works with a ton of different funders, federal funders, state funders, local funders, and I think you all are by far the most responsive funder that we have. Um, whether it's, yes, whether it's getting back to us on just a simple, silly question, providing resources to us. Um, I've been in this business for over 20 years, and I have had a funder that's as responsive as you are So thank you. It's very important to run around and work that we get our questions and answers. And appreciate that. Great. Thanks. I think I told Julia earlier, I paid people in this room. If you're starting to see that come forward. <laughs> Others? No? Thanks, Bob. For us, I, I believe as we progress and, and got into new phases of our organization and what we we're trying to do, it, it's weird how um, Liz is also going into those directions as well. Um, so it's like they have a big cousin um, who's also doing it. So, for example, uh, with the, the Rural Digital Equity Initiative that what's going on the, that network, um, the Digital Navigation Program, and we had already begun um, working on that for our life tech program, and then Crystal reached out to us and said, "Hey, we're we're doing this digital navigator thing. Uh, do you guys want to be a part of it?" Well, sure, we're already doing it. Um, the FOC. We were already looking for. Um, or we were already going into the direction where we were providing one on one financial coaching as an organization before we even met this. And then to find out that there was already a model, a strategy, and a, and a database that was already constructed to help us form KPIs and things like that that would help us better tell our story. That was helpful. And then to me, to come over here, I saw Courtney outside. She helped us uh, develop the graphic uh, of, of our process. Uh, so I told him thank you face to face for that. Uh, Justin uh, met him online. It's, it's just weird how all of the different pieces. So at this stage of our organization, just just seeing how we're growing together, and that's why we're so connected with this because we're doing the same work. And this is responsive to the needs of the rural communities, um, and that's a testament to what you all are doing. Um, so thank you for that. And and. That's why I, can, I want to continue to be a part of the network because I'm interested to see what we're going to do. Are you seeing something that we're not seeing and then shouldn't be seeing that and it may or may not fit our community? But at least if, if it's on your agenda is that we need to look at, and then maybe we'll get big enough one day if this is our agenda, then maybe we'll take a look at it. That's great. Um, and uh, I love that because I think, you know, it's something that I've said, I've been here for a little over three years and continue to say, um, you know, we are always trying to listen to what the community needs and hearing some of these high needs that have come up or even the organization needs. Um, it is interesting to see it kind of grow at the same pace, really specifically as life, because um, I work so closely with you all. But, um, you know, that, that is always the hope is that every product that we create, every program we create, every 
you know, resource that we develop is as helpful as you all need it to be, right? Um, and I think that's a lot of this conversation right now too, is um, we don't want any part of the advocacy model to be a burden on you. We want it to be only helpful. And so let's make sure that that's, that's always the case. So. Uh, I'd like to echo all of the sentiments thus far. Um, do all of by far the easiest, best, most robust plan that we have. And uh, I appreciate that. And I was hoping they didn't have left the room, but I wanted to shout out to Francesca, who's just done it right as a sounding board. As are you, we just get less of you than any of the other people. Exactly. A couple of other things that I'd like to mention. I really like the brain power to this room that's online. And I think all the all those sessions we get to talk to one another about what are we, what challenges are we encountering, how are we trying to address this, you know, all those sort of best practices for sharing that we've done with the digital world of people. Uh, because you know we're so spread out geographically, I think it's nice to be you know, connected intellectually and in different ways. And um, one of the things I really like is how this, and this is kind of um, to your point, Joe, I feel like I just I to the same thing. <laughs> um, how how you all are really interested in. in Hearing what we have already and in installing these components. I know that talking to Krista, we'll go on and on about how we're seeing, you know, digital access is really one of the keys to community development and, and you know, even health. So if they, if we're not limited to just the, what it says in the title of the program. You know, we're really seeing these initiatives that we have both and in the communities. Like ways in to try to solve the regular problems, and I really appreciate you all right there trying to, trying to solve the regular problems. So not just saying, well, we gave you money to do this, and you're kind of doing this, but you're, you're getting way more So I can't do that. I'm going to ask you to do that. Never. I would never do that. Um, no, that's great. And again, you know, something I offer, I feel like at every single advocacy session that we have is, um, you know, we we really can help with a lot of those funder conversations. I think that's one of the biggest areas that you know, we can bring you the programs, we can bring you the resources, we can bring you the partners, which, you know, I think um, a lot of you all talked about today. But I think that one area that we're really trying to figure out is how do we continue to help you increase that funding to support all of these really incredible programs long term? Um, and so use us, right? We're you know we're continuing to try and find some of those big grants that we can pull down um, and you know put back into the local communities. But feel free to let us know if you know Joe talked about a visual that we created for him that talked about the work that they've done over the last year. Um, or a funder conversation that you want us to be on just so you can have, you know, a national organization on the call with you talking about how we selected you, right? Of all the communities that want those things right now, you all are the ones that have them. Um, and that means something. And so, again, feel free to tap us whenever those opportunities come. Anything else that you wanted to share? Um, <clears throat> what has been the most challenging about this year? Probably nothing, right? <laughs> oh, and I should have asked too, sorry. Francesca, did you have anybody um, that wanted to say anything virtually? I don't think we have anyone who shared yet, uh, but feel Nobody, free. Um, virtually knew that I was going to call her out. So I can't see if somebody does have a question. So feel free to unmute yourself and just interrupt me if there's a question virtually or a comment. Okay. Sorry, do I see any other? Oh, challenging. Growth. <clears throat> that, that has been a challenge. Um, we, we, there was a point where we outgrew our people and um, capacity 
I came in issue. Um, we ended up, fortunately, we're going to hire uh, two new people um, that, that helped us catch up a bit. But with the addition, and I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow, but with the addition of the Bridges site um, and the number of clients that we're getting in the FOC, it has multiplied. It hasn't been, it's not addition, it's, it's multiplication. And to be able to handle that has been the biggest challenge. And then to have our funders come and say, we want you to expand this across more territories. And I, I have anxiety about that. Mm -hmm. so, um, but that has been our biggest challenge, just handling the growth and handling the intake. Um, Santa and I were talking today, we, we onboarded more clients this year than we have in the past two years. Um, and, and that, that is, um, stressful. So <laughs> I think I told somebody earlier, you went from maybe 70 clients the first year to, I think you had like 375 clients that had a service that was provided just this year, just astounding, just incredible. And you all came in matching shirts, which is probably the best part of all of it. So, <laughs> I love that. Thanks. Yeah, so Joe will be presenting, is it tomorrow? Tomorrow. Tomorrow um, on some of that work. So if you don't know what the Bridges and Career Opportunities model is, it was something that was created, um, I think probably about 10 years into this capital in the financial opportunity center model. And it was really built um, with the idea that we can help increase um, starting wages of individuals by building out some contextualized math and literacy training to help them get into career pathways that were offered locally, um, but maybe they couldn't get in there because they had lower math and literacy skills. And so really, you know, giving somebody a uh, contextualized program where they could understand it because that's the path that they wanted to go into. Um, so it's really built up a lot of really great partnerships and um, apprenticeship programs uh, within the life of the seat. So, um, and hopefully Joe will talk more tomorrow about some of the really great resources that they brought in with that. Any other challenges? Do you want to talk about some of the Bozeman challenges? Little ones, small challenges. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I've already heard the example in your campus. I'm just that. We uh, find ourselves over the last, certainly since 2019, so a little bit of the pandemic, uh, of having just a weird collision of different forces. Happening. So right now, um, a service job entry level McDonald's is based in the U.S. Um, but you can't live in those communities. So what we see is there are a lot of folks who are on paper making really good wages, but they can't afford housing, and they're priced out of on most of the federal and state. Sports business. So, for instance, they don't know how much staff because they make too much money. Mm -hmm. And yet, they're really, they're showing up for food. You know, three quarters of the people who are living in our overnight emergency shelter or homeless shelter, they um, are working full time. Mm -hmm. So, we have really, really that, that we just mm -hmm. can't really make sense of. You know, the other issue is that employers are, um, nobody, but nobody is for the staff. So everybody needs labor. So nobody is really going to work with us as we try to keep us with folks that work with them. That they just say, I need someone who can and I need them now. And I'll teach them that I'm going to on the job. And you know, that doesn't always work so well. Uh, what else can I throw into the mix? As of July, I'm saying, this is the last time I wrote the median price of a house in Bozeman is a million dollars. Um, and I think six or seven years ago, that same house would have been two hundred and fifty thousand dollars So, um, we kind of run out of words to talk about the situation, and um, we're not really sure what we can do. 
I'm not scared of anybody's intention. I was telling me I'm going to be the first that the, the main pulse of the city and the county and the state government is to keep recruiting for higher paying jobs. Right? So they're all into quantum computing and, and biotech, you know, all the sexy, glittery jobs. And I keep showing up <laughs> because, you know, I don't have room in a party to say, hey, who's going to change the oil in the cars? But who's going to go through the economy? Who's going to, you know, compare to the people? But nobody at the policy level seems to be. So, um, does that count as one challenge? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of our challenge. And, and we see, you know, the forecasting we're seeing is this is you know, five or ten year level. Um, and I should say it's been exacerbated because folks are moving into our community. State bringing their own jobs, working in the world. Um, so it's creating almost a second class of people who aren't really interacting with the folks who are coming from the very last folks. So there's also a culture issue that's happening to just to complicate it. So if anybody has any solutions, not on all of the years. <laughs> Nothing major, just to reach out. Great, thank you for sharing that. And I'm um, sensitive to time. I know there's probably a million challenges, and it would be amazing to hear that. I think we, our morning session ran a little later, and unfortunately, we have a board meeting in this room at 2 30, so we do have to be out around 2 o'clock. So I'm actually going to skip the next question, and I'm going to go, I'm actually going to change, shift it a little bit, and have you all talk amongst your groups. Um, for about 10 minutes on this question, and then we'll share out some of them. That way, everybody has an opportunity to talk. Um, this last one is What are your goals for the FOC in 2023? That's really what I'm most interested in. I want to know how this FOC fits into your organization's goals, strategy, um, work over the next year, and then how can Ruralist help you achieve that? So talk about both of those questions and be prepared to maybe share one or two um, of what you all talked about and uh, just um, or you can come up with it on your own that's fine too you can jot it down and then share it um, but yes please be prepared to share um, and we'll come back around and unfortunately virtually I think I can't hear you all so if you're talking to me and I've ignored you I, I figured out the problem Joe can probably fix it all right, I'm going to give you all 10, about 10 minutes to, to talk about this. <laughs> Hi, y'all. So I'm not sure they can, they can hear us. It's okay, because uh, we're in our own little virtual space here, but feel free. Let's just take a second. We have not seen the question. I threw it here in the chat. It's what are your goals for the FOC in 2023 and how could rural lives help you achieve them? Any initial thoughts? I know we're coming in to the end of 2022, which I still believe. So I don't know if anyone has given uh, a lot of thought yet, but now is, now is the perfect time. Any initial insights or things that you want to share. Feel free, if you don't want to come off mute, that's totally fine. Feel free to throw any comments in the chat. We can engage that way. Now we've got some newer sites on here as well as our existing FOCs. I'd love to hear from, from both, anyone who is just coming into this network and anyone who's been here for since the beginning. Oh my gosh, we've got quite a few. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Francesca, this is Sue from Community Action again um, in Uniontown. I, I have a comment I'd like to make. Yeah, I see. Okay. Um, if, I, if I could do something differently, um, what I really would love to see happen is that the FOC does not stand alone. 
so much as it does right now in our agency because of the demand and the programs focusing on program with program blinders on. Um, and we have, to we have to depend on referrals from those programs, our housing program, our rental assistance program, our WIC program, a lot of the referrals that come from there, we've had to struggle to, to get, it has improved. Um, what I would love to see in both our, the financial coach and I have had discussions about how we would love to see the FOC centered more in our agency and then the referrals out to the programs um, because it seems that all the programs, the clients and all the programs would benefit from the additional counseling from the financial coach, the additional counseling from the, the employment coach, um, the additional uh, talk about training and what Bridges can do for them um, as a part of what they're already involved in through the housing department, through the, the WIC department, through other programs that we have going on here. We're, we're looking at trying to implement that more. We're doing what we can to talk to program managers, meeting with them when they have team meetings to talk about more of what we can be doing for them, especially whenever employment and, and financial goals are, are distinctly part of what they do too. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you for sharing, Sue. You're welcome. And yeah, I, I'd love to hear, does anyone echo that? Is that a similar um, kind of thought that they were thinking that they might try and do, especially in this upcoming year, is make the FOC a more central service and have refers referral out systems from the FOC as opposed to kind of keeping it more standalone. So thank you, Sandra. So Sandra commented in the chat and I'll just read it aloud. We are brainstorming best ways to grow the BCO, the Bridges to Career Opportunity Program without duplicating services for our county. Um, JFS in Ohio means jobs agencies we welcome your ideas. Thank you for throwing that out there. Any any ideas for for Sandra here at our um, our NOCAC FOC in Ohio? Especially those sites who are integrating both the BCO and the FOC. I know that's that's a lot of work to take on. I'm curious to see how integrating both of those has gone for some of your sites. Any thoughts? Feel free to throw them out. And also feel free to take up space if there's um, ways that you would like role list and our team to step up to the plate and support you with the FOC, with the BCO, with funding, even with other resources from our pillars. Um, we heard a little bit about digital navigation. We heard a little bit about, of course, rural works, um, housing, which has been a huge issue prior to COVID, but has been further exacerbated. Are there any um, impacts that role list can make that would better support your site holistically, not just with the FOC? Hey, right, Sam, go ahead. I'm kind of jumping in here in between an audit that's happening right now, so I may be a little bit behind, um, but I heard about integrating FOC with basically into your uh, other programs. Um, so one of the things that we struggled with, especially at the beginning, was finding a way to not separate the FOC. But the way we look at it now is that FOC is basically the umbrella to all of our programs. Um, we are a housing agency here, so we ready dabble in the financial, a little bit into employment, but we never really focused on employment and even income support um, when we first obtained the FOC. So one of the ways that we look at it is that every client that walks through our doors starts at FOC until they basically prove otherwise. Um, and we've done that with other programs that we've brought in too. So we had a um, our ESG emergency solutions grant with our rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention. And that was kind of like the perfect program that worked with FOC. And that gave us a really good tool to kind of figure out a way of our, all of our clients can utilize the services in FOC in one way, shape, or form. So that was something that really helped us was finally having that aha moment of FOC doesn't necessarily have to be an own, its own separate program, when in reality, it's kind of more of an umbrella to our organization. So we mapped it out and had this whole chart that we put together, but I thought that maybe 
just putting it out there might help somebody else because we've been doing it for three years. And even though we may necessarily not get funding going forward, the FOC model for clinch pal is something that will always be utilized. Definitely. Thank you for sharing. And I, so I just wanted to ask here, um, especially for some of our newer sites, uh, how long do you think it, it took you guys to really um, move towards centering the FOC? And how long were you kind of struggling with implementing it at first? Because I know some of our sites, especially our newer ones, they're in the same situation where they're trying to figure out how to implement it in the best way, how to make sure um, it's meeting the needs of all of your clients as well as your, your staff are able to support it. So I'm just curious, rough estimate here, how, how long did it kind of take your site to kind of um, go forward with this strategy as centering the FOC as an umbrella? Oh, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm calling on you again, Sam. <laughs> or anyone else, anyone else? Sorry. I was just curious. Uh, yeah, for us, uh solid, feel good about it. It probably took us about a year and a half of trial and error. Not going to, you know, going to be totally honest here. Um, it, it, so for us, we had a lot of organizations that we tried to partner with in representing us as just as an FOC. And that's where we saw a lot of fall is that our clients had the understanding that this was totally separate and I have to enroll in this program, this program, this program in order to receive all the services that we were looking at. So we actually took the time to integrate the items that were needed for FOC with like our pre-purchase application and found a way that it all flew a little bit better. So I don't know if that really answers your question um, all that well. <laughs> oh, it does. It does. That's Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. And feel free, anyone else who has any other thoughts or questions of, um, or just challenges, you know, about the FOC, the integration of it, whether you're an existing FOC site or a new one, uh, and also looking to this upcoming year, if there's any particular goals that you've developed, um, new goals that you've developed for this upcoming year, and how our team, how Rural List can better support you. Hi, Francesca, it's Leslie. Hey, Lucy. Um, well, my goal obviously is to uh, become fully staffed. Um, so Emma is leaving in January. She's been here about two years. Um, and so I will be down all my staff. Um, but I would agree with Samantha. It probably took, and Brooke's on here too, a good year for it to become like just part of something that was um, more than just a separate program. Um, but I mean, we have, we, we started with internal referrals from, from programs we already work with and then went out to like probation and parole and um, like maternity. We have a couple of maternity houses, some homeless um, shelters, and then just work from there. And then as, as we were serving more and more people, the word got out, you know, more and more. And so, um, I think it is a combination of having somebody that's good at outreach and being able to um, go and promote the services that we provide along with um, building up a good relationship with the people that they are serving so that they, by word of mouth, they get more referrals. And anyone who hasn't shared, please feel free to throw any comments um, in the chat, including funding. I know we haven't really explicitly gone here yet, but any, any funding goals, funding challenges, um, either directly from LIST or even external to LIST. Thank you. 
Okay. A few minutes left, so I'd love to just hear what some of you all came up with. I think we have a full blown strategic planning session going on here. Well, I'm going to go here first because she beat you with the hand raised, but I don't know. Maybe you can talk into the microphone. We got a feedback from virtual participants that wasn't very loud. So I hope you guys can hear me. That's never been a problem. I learned from Ashley that you can be a benefit specialist and they have to have them from staff. That is my goal. I can't wait to go to my hires and see you make them be I desperately want to hire a benefit specialist, Kelly. Someone who's entire job is to help clients figure out what I need and they can use the code. Everybody look at Kelly. I'll go take a chance. But that, and we're currently now with the Digital Navigator site and figuring out how to tag team Echo Speed and Digital Navigator and how to communicate and then being on the universe and being these posters. Great. Thanks again, Paul. Who else wants to share? I know you all came up with amazing goals. Oh, you didn't answer that. How can rural list help? Forgot about that one. More money. Okay. Also, if you can all not say more money, that'd be great. <laughs> and help with Salesforce integration. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for our group, if there's a business community uh, that I'm looking forward to for 2023 within um, FOC, especially with the clients, it did so well when it comes down to the idea of sticking to their goals and the planning of the goal setting. And so that's pretty much a major one for me because I know for a fact if I can see you have an increase in your salary of a thousand dollars, then I know for a fact you can be that homeowner or you can start pouring into that IRA like you wish to. So for me that was a major one. I'm not that down the list. <laughs> Okay, so and another thing that I think from you know a company's perspective, um, we are looking to become more sustainable. Uh, trying to identify those entities out there that uh, will help us to make the financial opportunity center more sustainable. You know, right now it's kind of right of my own like the um, the workforce part of it. But you know, um, how do we find um we're looking to find um funders to fund that side of it? Because we know that the employers appreciate it. Because when you start working in the and you work in small business, you know, some of the things that we hear all the time is that if you work in the employees are a million and that's what they employ us, and they can make all the money and it's going to be expanding. And so when we get from those employers, it's no matter how much you pay, you know, they're going to always run out of money before they run, run out of week before they run out of money before the next pay period. And so um, the part that we're doing is helping them manage money better is one that they really appreciate. So we just need to figure out how to do that with your money. And how can you roll this down? How can rural list help with your clients? How about that? More money too? I not say that any of it. Yes, okay, I hear you all. <laughs> Great. Huh? Hi, everyone. I'm Sama, the FOC program director of life. Um, some of the conversations we're having, you know, everyone's here, so we're like, hey, we're going to do go back home. <laughs> um, so one of the biggest things is we're having expansion and we're currently in one county and we're hoping to expand in three. So a big goal for us is how do we do that and how do we copy and paste our team into other counties. So um, definitely one way to listen to help with that is connecting with other FOCs that, that have done that. Let know what how to scale quickly and how to actually, in a, you know, evidence base and what works. So um, I'm going to say that's one of the biggest things that we can definitely do is come this. 
and money. Uh, and money. You might as well just add it to everyone. <laughs> Others? Staff members, do you have anything else in the chair? Okay. Thank you. We're, we're kind of going back to Bozeman and, and the problems with him. In Missouri, I think there's probably a lot of other states in the country. The state has increased the federal number of increased minimum wage. In our case, the federal government's minimum wage almost level. What that really does is it means a lot of people who have already lost their eligibility to their son and all of their benefits. That's the increase in the state of the country. Which is another cycle of the injury that the plate was a little out of the thing. We're we're listing really values to talking to a group of over 200 people in this city to get them to update federal policy and that increase the government in the audience to be all about being the same. They can help us to have a change the group of things. Uh, I love that. So, I'm like, so, <laughs> so uh, if you all have not met our policy people at LIST, you have to meet them when they come today and tomorrow and Friday. Um, they are incredible. Mark is um, so easy to work with. Matt, Michelle, the three of them, two of them, I think, are doing a presentation. Someone else is part of it. So, they'll be all over the agenda. Look for them. It's Mark, Matt. And Michelle, I've never realized how it all ends before until just this moment. But they are so wonderful. And please get in their ear. We will share that with them. I'm sure they know just from the band of FOCs that we have across the country that that's an issue. But I think the more of us that can come forward with that type of information, the better. So again, another one of those moments where if you have opportunities that come up that you want us to advocate for certain issues, send them our way. We'll forward them to our policy team and that's what they're here for. So um, again, please please share with them. That's, that's a really great one. And it's not money, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and more money. And more money. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We probably have time for maybe one or two more. I'd love to hear others' goals or needs from rural lists or lists. And there's probably some really great ones virtually. I really do apologize for the not great virtual. Um, system that we set up. They we cannot hear them. So they probably are telling us the best um, information possible and so I'm sure Francesca will send out some great notes afterwards. Anybody else? No? One more. You don't have any goals for next year really? Thank you. Oh good. Well, go ahead, Corey, and then. Our 2023 goal is to really expand our employment training to the FOC. Um, the way that this can come is more money and. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and, and really providing uh, kind of connections to the final agency. Great. Liz can help us with um, day entry by letting us integrate our Salesforce. Integrate your own system in the Salesforce? Yes, so we can get them to one place and seek it. I have not heard that before, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, building bridges to your systems has been my dream for over three years. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna happen, but I did hear somebody recently talk about how they've been in IT forever and it's really not that hard. And so um, maybe we'll tap into that person and see if we can find a solution. Who's that? Uh, I, I actually don't remember who it was now. I just remember sitting on a call and someone being like, it's really not that hard. And, uh, I actually, we were close one time, we were close, right? We were close to building a bridge, but what we found out is they would have to build a bridge for like 130 different systems across the network, right? And so that's not um, 
But there could be another solution. We will continue to work. Is everybody using Lightning now? I've heard Lightning's really great. The Lightning version, yes. But so they are continuing to upgrade Salesforce. I would imagine something is on the horizon for a solution for data entry. So um, we'll keep working on that. And I think from an employer perspective, I know there are some really great ideas. We'll probably have another peer section coming up soon where we can talk about some of these, especially I know um, you all did a, um, a, you know, trying to sell the FOC to a local organization or a company at one point. So I'm sure you have some best practices from that. I mean, there's just some really great partnerships and um, you know, different funder models that are out there that uh, we'll try and find a better way to share. I wish this could have been longer. Um, we really, really next year are hoping for another full FOC session where um, every FOC across the country, all 130 are coming together to talk, talk just about FOC stuff. So um, hopefully it's not another add-on session like we had to do this time around and you all will gain a lot more, but um, we'll look to do a couple of peer-to-peer sessions throughout the year um, virtually uh, at mid. So we had a really great one in Appalachia where we did bring people together in person that we could look at doing more regionally um, throughout the year. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I think we need to do this as a group. And we've already said it earlier. We'll see more of you and you know this week. But we want to thank y'all again, you and uh, your team. Uh, you know, we heard from Sessions' name mentioned. We want to thank you, the FOC. I think we can all do a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we are going to formally end this session. We're transitioning to another meeting for our board after this year. Um, but please join us tonight for the opening session. We're going to have a really great, if you've ever heard of open space before, we're going to have just a way for people to kind of walk around the room and network and share best practices around workforce and small business. So hopefully you all will gain a lot of really great um, new ideas. Look for each other. Um, you all have a, probably a million more best practices to share with each other. And um, we'll see you tonight. If not, we'll see you tomorrow morning. But hopefully we'll see you tonight. Thank you all. Thanks, virtual team.